Welcome to episode two of the second season of the Books of My Life podcast. I'm your host, Haraf Albastani, arts and culture editor at The National. In this podcast, I explore the roles that books and stories have played in the lives of a number of influential figures, spanning a range of backgrounds. But before we start, make sure to subscribe and follow Books of My Life on your favorite podcast app to get all the new episodes as soon as they come out. Bobby Chin is a man of great warmth. He emits the most wonderfully radiant energy. It's easy to see why he's become a household name. And yet, he also has so much depth. Born to Egyptian and Chinese parents in New Zealand and raised between Egypt and the UK. In a past life, he worked on Wall Street before deciding to follow his calling and become a chef. He launched his culinary career in San Francisco before opening a restaurant in Vietnam to global acclaim. Since then, he's gone on to conquer the world of television, where the globe-trotting celebrity chef serves as a judge on Top Chef Middle East. However, he remains committed to sustainability and philanthropy, recognized for three years as a tourism ambassador for Vietnam and Europe, and since 2012, a WWF ambassador for sustainable seafood and coral triangle awareness. He is, whether he admits it or not, also a published author, having penned books on Vietnamese food, of course, centered on authenticity. As we discuss the books that most informed his own path, what becomes strikingly clear is just how far-reaching the world of literature is. Although we are all pulled towards different callings, literature and storytelling remain crucially formative parts of who we are. Books, that is to say, always play a part in getting us there. They are the compass that point us towards our very own North Stars. You've kind of lived all over the world, haven't you? You live in New Zealand, you live in, the, in Egypt, in the US, and your father, you yeah, were yeah, this is Egyptian exactly, and Chinese. This, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, this is exactly what every immigration officer does to me. <laughs> I'm the guy that fills out others and explain. So it's half Egyptian, half Chinese, born in New Zealand, educated between San Francisco, Egypt, and England. I was an American citizen, but I renounced in 2014. Okay. So I'm a Kiwi. All right. And... Um, yeah, I'm the guy that fills out, you know, the others and explain. And there's a lot of explaining to do. You don't, you don't want to stand behind. You don't want to stand behind me in immigration. <laughs> no, because I, 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 ask, I find, always find it interesting to speak to my my father's Emirati, my mother's British. So I always love to meet pe- other people who are kind of have interesting, um, diverse backgrounds. Um, but you truly, you've traveled a lot as well in your life, haven't you? Especially with your work. My work came later. I traveled okay. before the work, and okay. then when the work came. I was ready. <laughs> <laughs> um, and when you were growing up, were there any great travel books that, that inspired you? No, actually, I, I wasn't much of a reader. I basically went with the experience, and I just went with um, open mind, open heart, open hands, the whole shebang, and just went with the flow. So, yeah. And one of your most interesting projects was, um, was in Vietnam. How did that connection kind of begin? How did you first end up in Vietnam and, and end up opening a restaurant there? Well, I left Wall Street, and yes. I had a bunch of different jobs. I was a research analyst in Boca Raton, Florida. I worked for a hedge fund in San Francisco, and then I worked on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And I didn't like any of those jobs. I did. I could do the job. I just didn't like it. I just like you know, this is a this. There's got to be more to life than this. And then um, I started going to the Yellow Page. I, I would. I would. I don't know if it's fit for radio, but you know, I just basically told my boss to you know, okay, and. Um, and got fired eventually because they thought I, I, I lost it because there's a lot of pressure on the Florida New York Stock Exchange. Yeah. And so I started going to the yellow pages looking for a profession. You know, I'm going to automotive. I like, know nothing about cars and B bank. Nope, I'm getting out of BC. And I was like, I got to educational counselor. And um, that was a psychiatrist, double listing in the yellow pages. And um, one day I walked out and I heard a song that I heard a thousand times before. You can spend all your time making money you can spend all your love making time. And that's when I realized the eureka moment, I got to go find something that I love. And I was always a class clown. And, um, and I started selling seafood to just as another job, just as a part-time job. And I met all the chefs. I was like, wow, this is kind of cool. You know, they wear white jackets. They look like doctors. My mother wanted a doctor. So I was like, you know, this is as close as I'm going to get to that. But I like the fact of the creativity. I like the fact that I'm not going to work with the same people every day. I like the fact that, you know, um, you know, there's paintings and flowers and just this, everything about that environment appealed to me. And my parents weren't really thrilled with my decision-making because my, my education is quite expensive. 
and they thought I had an attitude problem. And I said, well, here's the deal. Either I said, I want to be a chef. They're like, no, we're not, you know, you're not going to get it. You're not going to, we're not going to support that. You're, you know, we paid for your education and you're on your own. And I was like, well, you got two choices. Either I'm going to be a chef or be a clown. Do you want a clown or do you want a chef? And so they're like, we're not supporting either one. So I went to the Groundlings, the improvisational comedy uh, troupe in LA. I said it improvisational comedy, started working as a waiter. And then moved to San Francisco to work at nicer restaurants to make more money because this is a flexible job, right? I'm not coming in tonight. I got a rehearsal, right? But I figured that I can go do stand up comedy. My dad walks in the restaurant, says, "What are you, a stand up comic? Uh, stand up comic waiter? Number one, you're not funny. Two, you're a crappy waiter. Three, your education is far too expensive. Think that you're a funny waiter. <laughs> Vietnam's the future." I like to call my dad Phil Gold Frankie because by the time he finishes a spiel. If both hands are not up in the air, right? So it's like, you know, <laughs> Vietnam, population, 70 million, uh, 97% of the population under the age of 30, highly educated workforce, isolated for the last thousand years, fighting wars for their independence. Natural resource, three quarters the size of California. They have Tunson, they got gold, they got oil, they got everything with the greatest resources being this young, dynamic population. It'll be the next place for light manufacturing. This is not another baby tiger. This is the tail of the dragon. By the time you got to the tail of the dragon, both hands are up in the air. So I was like, okay, <laughs> let me see this place. And so I went there and I was like, look at the food. And no one could describe that. What was, you know, I was at, what was the food like? And no one could describe it. So I said, fly me out. I'll take a look. And I was like, wow, it's everything that they talk about being a great food. Do you talk to any great French chef? They'll tell you it's a contrast of textures and flavors and temperatures. Huh? And I was like, these guys are doing it in their pajamas, right? <laughs> one dish three generations, like nothing else I've ever tasted in my life. And I was like, damn, I'm going to come here. And I'm going to learn this, learn from here. Went to work for the top French restaurant in San Francisco, begged him for a job and, you know, he refused. And I was like, you know, I'm going to be a chef and I want to work for you. I got no bad habits. And then after I work for you, I'm going to go to Vietnam and go open a restaurant. The guys, what the hell? So that's what I did. I went to Vietnam and I wanted to learn the food. And I thought I'd stay for a year or two years. It was very difficult. Um, you can call it failure. I considered it really important life lessons. And I kept on staying and I kept on stubborn. I, I will succeed. And eventually I'm, you know, Financial Times reporters like, why are you here? You could be anywhere in the world. And I was like, yeah, but I need a decent view for my food. My, my demi gloss is not a gravy, right? I mean, it's not called a topping. It's called a garnish. You know, I just want the vocabulary to be right. And then the press started coming in, and, and I started feeding really important people. And, and I, I was like, here's my lifestyle. It's a microcosm of the world outside. And all of a sudden, I've got access to these incredible people that would not have the time of day for me anywhere else in the world. And I fell in love with the people, and the people I fed were my friends, and, or they became my friends. And my lifestyle just became so enjoyable. And, you know, 22 years later, <laughs> you know, yeah, it was, it's been a journey. And obviously we're here speaking at a literature festival. Um, I'm wondering, in this incredible journey that you've had, um, especially as a, as a chef, were there, any, were there any great books that inspired you when you were younger? Were there any that stood out? Do you think there, were any, do you think there still aren't enough great books about that journey? Uh, Lust for Life by Irving Stone. Um, the story of uh, Van Gogh, I think, was very inspirational. Uh, Van Gogh never sold a painting in his life other than to the one he sold to his brother. Um, he only started painting when he was 30. So that just gave me the idea that it's never too late. Yeah. Death is too late. <laughs> <laughs> You're dead. It's over, <laughs> right? So you got time. Um, that, was, well, that was a great book. Um, all the other books were shoved down my throat. So I read a lot of books in English boarding school, but I was like, oh, Dickens? You know, Shakespeare, who speaks like that? <laughs> um, I think the books I was reading were all just to become successful. You know, the, you know uh, George Soros's uh, The Alchemy of Finance, you know, all that stuff. Um, Jean Le Carré, you know, because, you know, uh, how do you prepare for being a trader? You got to know, you got to be a spy. You got to know, you know <laughs> who's got the stock behind them, you know, it's just all that stuff. But it didn't, that was... Not nothing like 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 lust for life. Um, that just gave me a belief because Van Gogh was one of my favorite painters. He lived. In, I went to um, an immersive exhibition of his 
Um, and they had quite a lot of information about his life. And he, it really was such a fascinating guy. Like you say, it's, it's a tragic story, but like you say, there isn't a lot about him that is inspirational. He came from a rich family. He mm -hmm. wasn't a poor kid, right? Um, he didn't believe in the art that their family was selling in the gallery. You know, um, he was an evangelist. Um, and I think the love of his brother is something that was very deep, that you have this love for your sibling that I could relate to. Um, and then I think he probably went crazy because he mixed his own paints, and there's a ton of lead in those paints. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Let's always, there's, there, was, there was a story about, um, I think it was a Palantine, Palantine Hill in ancient Rome, where there was a story that the, the reason why so many of the Roman nobles were so seemingly bonkers is because of the amount, of, because of they were, the lead piping they were using. And their water supplies are all apparently. I'm not sure. I've never looked into how historically accurate it is, mm. but lead seems to there seems to be a relationship between lead and uh, yeah. They just they just health. they're just announcing they're they're going to reduce the amount of lead in baby food by like. So I was like, why is there lead in baby food? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You yeah. know what's going what, on? Here? What role is that serving? No idea. It's crazy. I mean, listen, we're living in a really crazy world, and I think we've got to start asking questions because if we don't get if we got need we need answers to the questions, and they're not answering them. You know, and that, and I think that is a sign of when things start to fall apart, and things are falling apart around us. You know, it's like looking at um, uh, anxiety amongst young girls. I was like, it spikes in 2010. What happened in 2010? The selfie camera came onto the iPhone and Instagram. Right? Um, we're starting to see like correlations of all this stuff. You know, and we need to make those connections. And, we, and, and as, as you get older, as you're older, we didn't have any of these problems. I mean, I wasn't popular in school. Big deal. I was only in school. Now, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm popular everywhere because of my numbers. You know, it, it's, 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 yeah. Sorry, I'm going on a tangent. No, no, not at all. Um, social media algorithms and the roles that they, they play and, and, and the impact they've had actually haven't been studied anywhere near as much as they, they should. But, um, one thing that really stands out to me about your work and your career is that you are thinking about the future and you've been recognized, especially with sustainable seafood. Um, and I'm wondering, did that just come out as a natural extension of your work and your familiarity with the supply chains and seafood or, or were there any great kind of resources that you've used to study along the way as well? You're an intellect. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a guy that just goes with experience. Okay. So a friend of mine invited me uh, to Irian Jaya, which is one of the greatest diving sites in the world. Uh, Jacques Rousteau said it was the best diving in the world for biodiversity and clarity of water. Most people don't get to get to, the, do, get to this place because you got to take like two airplanes on an airline called Maripati, which their slogan is get the feeling. Okay. What does Mar Maripati mean? It means pigeon airline. Not really one of the, you know, um, Anyway, um, I go into the water and I see just incredible biodiversity that I've never seen before. I've seen clams larger than this table. The only reason I only got this size, it was wedged between corals. And, um, and I recognize I'm so incredibly privileged to see this. Um, and I, I think that as we get older, we try to, to improve ourselves and how do you improve as a chef? Is it, is it about technique? Is it making the perfect beurre blanc sauce? Is it just cooking a steak medium rare? What is it? And because of my experience in Vietnam and my clients that I had, it's like, you know, you got to be thinking of other things. And many of them were NGOs. And, you know, I was serving swordfish. And I was like, why are you serving swordfish? You know, I was like, what's wrong with swordfish? It's an endangered species. It's going to be on the endangered list another five, 10 years. And I was like, really? It's like, I didn't know that. They take it off the menu. Um, what else should I be thinking about? It says you should be thinking about helping fair trade. So I was like, well, how do I know what the fair trade is? Oh, well, just get in touch with, uh, um, with this organization and, um, you'll find all the projects that the EU have funded in fair trade. And then I'll help and source my ingredients from them. Then all that started to change. And then when people started knowing, I started doing that, then I became the ambassador for WWF on sustainable seafood for Asia and the coral, uh, uh, the coral triangle, which has, which is like the Amazon of the ocean has great biodiversity and it's going to die if we don't protect it. Um, all of my work has literally been, um, just a progression, a natural organic progression into something totally different. And I will say yes, literally to anything because 
I feel alive that way, you know? So I'm constantly, I mean, like, you know, I'm sitting today with the, the minister of uh, climate change and the environment, you know, I think it's crazy. You know, I'm just a cook that just got lucky that kept on saying yes. And I'll sit on stage and I will say whatever I have to say, the, the stuff that I know to the experience that I'm getting. And I can talk to someone. You can, someone can just say something to me. I'm like, okay, let me be your sponge and let me be an outlet and let me communicate that because I have an audience and I will do that for the cause of, you know, when I think about climate change as an example, um, those that did the least amount of damage will suffer the most. That's a tragedy. You know, when the Titanic is going down, there'll be people that will be dancing and singing and listening to music and eating the food and there'll be those that will be getting the lifeboats ready. I'll be getting the lifeboats ready. And is that something that you that you channel into your work, your your writing as well? My writing? Yeah. I write. I haven't done that. I wrote a book. It was called um, Wild Wild East, and it was my experience of opening restaurants in a centralized uh, central economy, government-controlled economy into a free market. Yeah. Um, you know, my work as far as the environment and all that stuff is really starting to take off because I work with an organization called Resilient Cities. Yeah. And they asked me to be their ambassador for um, their Urban Eats campaign, which is about creating a more circular food system and educating the population on, um, on food waste uh, and the effects of our broken industrial uh, food system. And so now I haven't written anything per se. I just kind of like speak about it. Right. And can you imagine ever writing a cookbook? Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. Are there any great cookbooks, you think? There's a lot of great cookbooks. Um, and it's mostly about technique and, you know, um, then those are the book, cookbooks that appealed to me. They were, they were beautifully photographed. Um, they were the techniques. I think now, understanding what I know now and learning about health as well, because I didn't just do it. So I'm, I'm a work in progress, right? There's a lot of work that needs to be done. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's um, your the health aspects of food, um, the nutritious aspect of food, the policies towards food, the effects of that food on our system. So seven leading causes of death are diet related. Um, there's the impact to the people that make our food. It's terrible. They're essential workers and they're not really treated very well. They're not paid well. Um, and then there's the environmental damage. So all of that, I think, is an inspiration. What happens is that as it starts to brew in me, it'll come out and organically. I think that's a really interesting point. I think for me, a lot of the great cookbooks are the ones that bring in other aspects around cooking. There's a great one. Um, I'm probably butchering the name. I think it's, it's an um, Iraqi cookbook, I believe, called uh, it's based on an old Iraqi phrase, which is a house with a date palm will never starve. And obviously there's a lot of cultural um, ideas around that as well. So like you say, um, a great cookbook that doesn't just say, here's a bunch of recipes, but here, is how, you know, here, is the, here are the techniques, here are the repercussions, here's how it interacts with your body. Um, yeah. Do you think, are there any great examples like that that, you can, that stand out to you? No. Or do you think it's yet to be written? No, no, yeah, it needs to be written. I mean, like, you know, I, I, I took the, uh, the plant-based uh, nutrition course at Cornell University under Dr. Colin Campbell. So it's like, I've been saying that, like, chefs are really all about making food this pleasurable experience. Yeah. It's like, I just want that sauce to be like silk in your mouth. I want it, I want it, you know, you know, to, I want perfection in everything, every element on that plate. Um. The question is, is it healthy for you, right? Mm. And health is not part of the equation for a chef, generally speaking, right? If someone says to me, like, listen, I've got a, I got a high blood pressure, please no salt. Yeah, it's not going <laughs> to taste as good, right? Yeah. I, I'm diabetic. I can't have sugar. Oh, well, then there's no dessert for you, right? Um, how that, those all became an inspiration because like, well, how do I feed you? How do I feed, if health is an issue, what should I be feeding? So I took the course. And I started learning all this stuff and I started detoxing, right? I started going to like really swank places and really, you know, really horrible places, you know, to not horrible, like not, not luxury. And there's nothing pleasant about, you know, Moon River, you know, colonics and all that stuff. Um, but I started looking at my health and the food that I was eating and how I felt after I did 
seven days of this stuff. And there's a great place actually in Pune. Um, I spent three weeks in this place. They did the Ayurvedic detox thing, which is, I don't know if you've ever, ever done anything like that. I was about to, it's funny, I was, in my mind, I was just about to, I was saving a question about, I wonder if you'd ever explored Ayurvedic diets before. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Ayurvedic's amazing. Yeah. There's something about an Ayurvedic doctor. Let's start there. Okay, he's got no diploma on the wall. Okay, he's got the third eye highlighted to you. <laughs> right? And he's taking me a tongue, let me get your eye, here's your pulse. And then he asked me a question. Every question he asked me, I gave him the opposite. Mm-hmm. You know? Are you constipated? No. Do you travel a lot? No. I was just doing all these things. I just lied. And the guy like looks at me and says, I don't know what you're telling me because everything you're telling me, your pulse is telling me and your eyes is telling me the opposite. And if you continue with whatever lifestyle you have, you'll, you'll, be, uh, you'll be diabetic. And I was like, really? Yeah. And then he kept on going on and on. About, you know. And he also went into my relationship. But he was absolutely spot on. And so I started looking at Ayurvedic. It's a lo- it's the longest, oldest medical uh, system known. Um, and it, they do the same pulse as the Chinese, the traditional Chinese. And then you have Tibetan. Tibetan also is a cross between Ayurvedic and there's a fantastic place up in um, the Himalayas, foothills of the Himalayas called Bana. You know, so I go and I experience, yes. I'll do anything. Yes. I literally, I say yes, I'll do anything just to experience it. And so I did it. And... Um, Yeah, our Vedic's got a lot of uh, credibility with me as far as I'm concerned. That brings us to the end of this episode of Books of My Life Season 2. I hope you found it as insightful as I did. If you're interested in hearing more conversations like this, make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Angami, or your favorite podcasting platform. Next week, I sit down with historian and journalist Shobani Bas. Stay tuned for more captivating conversations and gripping stories. This episode was produced by Arthur Edison and Duaf Farid. I'm your host, Harith Al-Bistani. Thanks for listening.